better that way. We, we have some loudness there. Well, thank you very much, Floyd, for that kind introduction. I, uh, Georgists are very loquacious, so I, earlier today, took a few notes to keep me from going off the rails, because he said, just talk for about 20 minutes or so. And of course, Georgium is a pretty comprehensive philosophy, so you can kind of hang anything on it sort of thing, solve the housing crisis, solve intergenerational uh, inequality, uh, you know, uh, solve the ecology crisis. I mean, everybody's got their, uh, you know, their particular area that they want to look at. So, so in that sense, uh, it can be a very diffuse movement and lose its laser focus very easily. And so I, you know, I, I think that's, that can be a bit of a problem in a way. But on the other hand, because it can really be a long-term solution to things like affordable housing and that, you, you do have to watch what's fashionable, right? Because I've been talking of this stuff for 30 or 40 years. And of course, the housing crisis, we predicted a housing crisis 30 or 40 years ago. <laughs> and there was one then too in many ways, right? It's never gone away. But it's like so in the face uh, at all levels of government, from municipal up to the federal, you know. I wish Christia Freeland was here because she, she is a Georgist. You're not going to believe that because I'm sure she's never said a word in the last seven years about Henry George. She's probably afraid too many crazies will come out of the woodwork, but you know. But she, her father read her Progress in Poverty to her, all 500 pages, not the abridged version, when she was like 12 years old, right? So, but, and she wrote about it in her book, Plutocrats. But she's never, and there's jurisdictional issues in Canada because we're a confederation and feds don't have uh, control over property and civil rights under the, you know, the BNA Act of 1867. So, you know, she could cajole though, right? So we, and I, when I travel internationally, people say, well, Frank, why don't you ask Christy, you know her, get Georgism going, right? I said, well, I, she's not going to do anything, you know, like, like her father suggested to her at dinner one night, he told me, well, just get rid of the principal residence exemption uh, under the uh, Income Tax Act, you know, when you sell a house, right? So there's no capital gains on it. And she said, well, why would I do that? I'd be, I, you know, I'd be unelected immediately. There'd be a revolution, and, you know, so. So he said, well, that's a great way to scoop up all this economic rent in the, in the world, right? So anyway, I, uh, I want to say uh, a couple of things about history, uh, a couple of things conceptually, uh, and then I want to make some advocacy suggestions as well for BC. And why I think BC is perhaps of all the provinces on the cusp of maybe making some real progress on this issue um, and tell you the reasons for that. Now in terms of the history, uh, it's, pretty, uh, it's pretty good here in this province. You know, George visited BC, he, he lived in California, that's where he moved out there. And he came up here somewhere in the gold rush. So he was here in this area very early. And all the early mayors around this area, New Westminster and Vancouver, in the early part of the 20th century, L.D. Taylor back in 1900, 1910, they were all hardcore Georgians. And you had a system. You, you, you essentially had a system here that you know, was focused exclusively on the land values, we call it, or the site values, right? So, and then that continued right on through. You, you have the best assessment authority in North America for Georgia's reasons, okay? And, it's, and I'm not just saying that because, you know, what we like, what it does that we like. I'm saying it because other organizations like the International Association of Assessing Officers says it's the best assessment. You know, there's reasons for that. It does the annual assessments, that's good. Ontario's delayed its uh, reassessment now, like I think it's getting up to 10 years and that's going to be hell when they start to go back to do that as it was hell when they did it back in the 1990s. But you guys do that, that gets you top marks. But for us the main thing is that split between the land value and the building value on your notice of property assessment, which most young people will never have seen. <laughs> because they don't own a house, you don't get a property. So, because your, your landlord is never going to give it to you usually, right? You see, he'll stick it in your rent somehow, but he's not going to give you the notice. You know, he'll just say, yeah, the taxes here are terrible. I got to raise the rent, right? Or something like that. So uh, that is extremely important. And that allows then for Floyd and his team to get aggregated data instantly, right? And then that tells him a lot because that's pretty good data. I'm not saying it's perfect, but it's good data. I bought a house here recently, yeah. and the assessment was within hundred thousand dollars of what I paid for it. That's yeah. insane. It's yeah. so accurate. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty. It's because they they look at market transactions, right? So they're they're definitely doing that. But 
But then he can use something like that to come to the obvious conclusion from his previous analysis from StatsCan that the national data is utterly inaccurate. Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, you can take this chair if they want to. I can, I can, I'm going to stand for a few minutes. You can take it momentarily. Uh, yeah. Only that, like, nearest third of it is empty. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We'll move there when they clear out. Right. So they, they know, you know, Floyd's group knows right off that. So he goes back to StatsCan and says, you've got to be kidding. But no, but they don't know because they don't have other jurisdictions like Ontario and Quebec, where there's a lot of urban ground rent there and land value to... Uh, they don't get that data because the uh, MPAC in Ontario, the uh, Municipal Property Assessment Corporation in Ontario, doesn't do the split. They used to, but they don't do it anymore, right? So, but people like covering up this economic intelligence, okay? Okay, so that, uh, the other thing is, uh, George was a philosopher of reconciliation, okay? And now that's, that's a word that means a lot today for, for a lot of people, but I mean it in the sense that he's not a, an economist of trade-offs. So he is not going to talk like an economist usually talks now, oh, we trade off equity with efficiency, for instance. So you're going to lose some efficiency because of the deadweight losses in terms of uh, taxes on consumption and income, but uh, you know we'll get some equity there. We'll get more equity. So they view it as a trade-off all the time. And uh, George doesn't do that. He says we can advance both. And it's the same thing with, uh, you know, you can go down the list of all the tension points today on both sides, and, and he wants to reconcile these things. Uh, and I think that uh, that point gets lost a lot because we always have this philosophy of trade-offs in economists, right? So, so yes, we have a social policy. We want to pour billions now into uh, BC bills. You've got $2 billion on Monday. You already had five. I think about three billion. I'm losing count, guys. How many billions you're getting in terms of that? But you know, yes, you're going to release some public land that well, that's we call that sort of low-hanging fruit. You're going to release some public land to make that possible. But you know, that's situated. Those location values may not be good values for having people close to their workplaces and that. Like you, you just don't know what's being released. Also, I can't get any information here on whether they're leasing it, whether they're selling it in fee simple or how they're doing it, right? Or you, you, the citizens of this province ought to be very careful about what's going on there because that can get away with you. And that will, could just create a whole new round of speculation in the province, could raise land values even more, and you, you just make the problem worse, which is what usually happens in other jurisdictions. You don't fix it. It's like infrastructure spending. We all know that you're, you've got to get land value capture in place around infrastructure spending because, um, you, you know, there's a lot of speculation. That's where the buildings are going to go around, these transportation hubs and that. This value is being created by public expenditure, but you never hear a word about it from politicians. Dave, Dave exempted here. But, so, you know, there's these huge benefits that ought to be clawed back. You shouldn't have to charge for public transit. You know, it should be for free if you, you got those land value captures back. So, and there's a lot of work being done around the world on that, and we all know what it is, but to get it in place politically is really tough. Now, of course, in terms of classical economics, uh, what we have here is a lot of befuddlements around real estate. And it all started, as a long sort of history and story here, it all started with the switch from classical economics and George is basically, he died in 1897, he's basically the last classical political economist. And all the political economists, Ricardo, Marx, uh, Adam Smith, all looked upon land as a distinctive factor of production. And it had a certain moral turpitude or opprobrium attached to it, right? Because, you know, it was Adam Smith who said, you know, the so-called philosopher of capitalism and modern economics and all that stuff, but he said, you know, landlords reap where they do not sow. And he was very, and nobody reads book five of the Wealth of Nations, which is the most important book, because he basically says ground rent tax is the best tax. You know, and he goes through all different taxes there. So they went all through this. They all spoke the same way. Even Karl Marx, you know, he had getting rent. He wanted to get everything, but he, he certainly wanted to get at the rent too. <laughs> and he also said uh, LBC would extend the life of capitalism. Yeah, well, he called, Mar uh, he called George a, a um, 
uh, the last gasp of freebooting capitalism. But George said, you know, he was the most impoverished philosopher he'd ever read, but wrote a nice, nice letter, a nice eulogy when Marx died, which was 1884, I think, yeah. So my cutoff for the end, and this is, of course, rough, for the end of classical economics is when George died in 1897. His last book is The Science of Political Economy. And after that, we get something called neoclassical economics. And what it did is it collapsed land as a distinctive factor of production into capital. So there only became two factors in neoclassical economics, capital and labor. And it has been like that, and there's algebraic stuff and margin stuff around it. It's been like that now for 150 years, I would say, because the marginal set came in the 1870s. So that is crucial. And that's why we now get the spillover into what I would call, I wrote it down here, the great conceptual and linguistic befuddlements attaching to real estate. Well, the first one is land. Because if, if you go to the Assessment Act of Ontario, um, land is defined, well, you all know what land is, right? Well, not really, because you haven't read the Assessment Act of Ontario in the definition <laughs> section, because land is this building. It defines land as capital improvements. Land includes land and buildings and so on. So, so listen to this. Land includes all buildings or any part of any building, all structures, machinery, and fixtures erected or placed thereon in order, honor, or fixed to the land. Now, you go to the BC Assessment Authority, which I had the great uh, assessment act, I should say, sets up the BC Assessment Authority, which I had the great pleasure of reading this morning. And uh, it, it has a different definition. It, it has improvements as distinct from land. But then you go down to property, and it muddles the two up again. Okay? So it's all part of this linguistic you know, fog that's out there around this. Um, a house. People always talk about a house, right? Well, a house is two distinctive things. It's the house you live in. The home flipping tax measure that was in the budget on Wednesday does not apply to flipping raw land, okay? If you're gonna do that, it just applies to a home or a house. But we know a house is not just a house, it's something else, it's gotta sit somewhere, you know? Even if it's a strato, 50 stories, it's gotta sit somewhere. So that's just uh, uh, another example that we have to change the language around this, and it's really hard because there's all kinds of legal fictions set up in legislation and in other types of areas to make this this illegal fiction of what's done. And you've got to keep your eye on that because people, uh, you just won't be able to talk to people. And by the way, the French word for tax, percevoir, it means to perceive. Right? It's, it, it's the same word. Look it up in the dictionary. It's a fascinating thing in a way. Because, you know, tax authorities always want to define a tax in terms of what you can see. So if you have lots of windows in your house in the 18th century, you're a rich person. So people boarded up their windows, bricked up their windows at that point, right? So, you know, these were indicia of ability to pay. And that, was, and that ability to pay is indicia of taxable capacity of individuals, right? Your problem is that economic ground rent is not something that comes out of individual uh, taxable capacity. We, we use a Latin term, that's impersonum taxation. Land value taxation inverts that whole world because it's a tax on in, inert property. And what you have there then is a tax whose, we have a fancy word for it in the tax world, tax exigibility is based on an economic event today. There has to be some event. Flip that house under two years, I got you, right? So then you make all kinds of your moves in terms of manipulating the economic event, right, to try to get out of paying the tax. So it's always going to be that struggle between the percevoir, the tax, the perception, um, and uh, the, the collective, you know, the great collective community created value that's all around us here. Uh, the other, one last point on this, and it's a philosophical point, there's, you can read every tax journal in the country and you'll never see an article on tax justification, you know. You just, it's just assumed, oh yeah, well, you know, we'll, we'll do this home flipping tax and yeah, it's got to get some revenue, but every, anybody who looks at it for two minutes knows that the $44 million uh, project. Don't get too excited, Dave. There's not a lot coming to the city council for that. <laughs> the $44 million projected in revenue next year comes into effect in January next year. It's going to be, it's not, 
Well, you look at the budget in two years and see how much they got out of that. It's not going to be very much, right? And, and it's all over the place. We have a vacant unit tax in Ottawa now, following you guys, because you, you came up with it first. We have it in Ottawa now as the second year. But, uh, and it has got some revenue, 10 million. But 10 million is such, you know, and that's going to affordable housing. It's nothing. It's just nothing, right? We're talking $3 trillion here, you know? What's, okay, advocacy. Uh, and I haven't been in advocacy for, I did a lot back in the 1990s, but I would say it's been 15 years. I made a lot of presentations before tax commissions and that, and, and you get a bit jaded after a while because they all sit there and agree with you, and yeah, we understand the pedigree of this and all of that, and then it goes on a shelf and you never hear from them again because it's politically, it's, a, it's, it's collective, okay? It's, you, you have to, you're working with a systemic change here. And that's always going to be the hardest change. And people write papers on this in social innovation and on how why systemic change like that is so hard, right? But here's what I suggest just to get things rolling. And I kind of contradicting myself here, being a hypocrite a bit. I think you guys should uh, start advocating for a BC, for want of a better name, Fair Tax Commission. I would probably come up with a better name. Yeah. And number of reasons for that. One is I'm pretty convinced the time is right. Traveling all over the country is the same problem and nobody has a real solution and the solutions they propose exacerbates the problem. So, so I think the time's right. Plus just look at local politics. You've got an election coming up here uh, in October I believe. Is that correct? And we're gonna have a federal election next year so there's and Ontario is not too far behind. I think Ontario might be next year as well. So yeah, oh, Ontario is the disasters on there. And then, then you've got the indigenous land titles issue. There's a lot of commonality between the Georgia's philosophy and indigenous approach to nature and land, and we really need to cultivate that more. We haven't done it that well. Um, and, you know, there's some, they we're making some significant changes, as I understand, to the Land Act here. I did take a little peek at it this morning. I think all that's been put on hold. But a lot of that's, those changes are directed at dealing with Aboriginal lands and Aboriginal title and so on. And we need, we need to get into that conversation. So I'm hoping we can do more down the road on that. And, uh, yeah, of course, this is an obvious point, but we have to create the constituencies for it and, and just let people know that, like in the budget yesterday on that home flipping tax, it had a little burp at the beginning and it said, yes, you know, there's high interest rates and all this stuff and cost of land is contributing to the increase. Well, that's the main, that's historically the main driver, but let's put some real numbers to that. I'm glad there's numbers, engineers and number crunchers here, right? Let's see if we could look at some longitudinal studies there because we, we have this historical tax base too. You just got the current base, right? But we can have some historicals. I'm sure it's a lot higher. That's the main factor there. Uh, land values are very sensitive to interest rates, so that's why they come, they decrease roughly in market value of housing by maybe 15%. I'm just generalizing here in the last year or so, is because of higher interest rates reducing the cost of land. Interest rates go down, land rates go up. That's just a, a law, of law of economics and a law of things. There. Anyway, I've talked enough. I'd like, like to. Hear from so you we'll in a. Frank, yeah. yeah. We'll be carrying for another four minutes or, or more. Yeah. I think we should do a round of applause. Yeah. yeah. <laughs>